We greet all of you tonight in the name of Christ. Thankful that you're with us. We desire to all be all of one accord, one heart, one mind, one judgment. Take this opportunity also to welcome those who join us on live stream. We appreciate your fellowship very much. Kindred spirits. Tonight will be the 62nd installment in this series. We'll be going over chapter 39. From here uh, on to the end of the book, it's all about Joseph. And there are some th other people that are mentioned, but it's in regard to Joseph that they're mentioned. And as you know, Genesis, the next book is Exodus. And this is how God is preparing a nation. Yeah. And as soon as he's laid the groundwork for it and supplied the lineage, proper lineages that, for the Messiah and for the priests and so forth, and after it's fulfilled the prophecy that he gave to Abraham, his posterity would be in Egypt for 430 years, but they'd be in bondage for 400 years. In the fourth generation, they'd come out. Now you're, all this is leading up, up to that. <clears throat> now remember at the time of the text, Joseph is a young man probably just a little over 18 years of age, or 17 years of age. He, when he went down there, he was 17, and it appears as though this all developed rather rapidly, so he's still going out in his teens, and you want to see if uh, how this compares to the teens you know. <laughs> Can I make that comparison? This is a real teenager. Now we left off with him in chapter 37. Chapter 38 was about Judah. A series of strange events that ended up with one of the people in Christ's lineage, Pharaoh's. Now he returns to Joseph. The 37th chapter left off with Joseph being sold as a slave. Now we take, we're going to take it from there. Verse chapter 39. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. Now, you all remember who the Ishmaelites were. If you don't, that was the first son that Abraham had through Hagar, Ishmael. And the Lord was with Joseph. Remember, now he's a, he's a young He's a man. And Joseph, and the Lord is with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him. And he made him, Potiphar, made him overseer over his house. And all that he had put, all that he had, he put into his hand. And it came to pass from that time that he was made, he made him an overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not what he had. He didn't know how much he had at all. He didn't know how big his bank account was, his field, flocks. He didn't know. He only knew about the bread which he did eat. He just, the only thing he knew about what he had was his meal. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. So, that, <laughs> so you imagine like a millionaire turning everything over to a 17-year-old. I mean, can you imagine it? Well, if you're a Bible student, you can. 
And it came to pass that after these things, his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused, and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. Is he not concerned about it? He's not even concerned about what I'm doing because he trusts me. There's none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? It came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by the garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand, and he fled and got him out. And it came to pass, when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he, that's Potiphar, he brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. It came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord, that's Potiphar, came home. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me, and it came to pass as I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled out. It came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. Joseph's master took him, put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was a doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand. Boy, that's trust, huh? Yeah, if you're a worker, you should be that kind of worker. Amen. Because the Lord is with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it. Yeah. I say the Lord made it. Whatever he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Amen. Well, there's some brief introductory thoughts I'd like to give because it's important to me that everyone understands the background, the scriptural background of these events and why people did what they did and so forth, not be confused about it. To this point in Genesis, there have been a number of things that occur that a Christian would never do, done by people of faith. The ministers of our day, I blush to say, are not scripturally intelligent as a rule. There's exceptions, praise God. They don't know why it's this way. And it's important to me that you, some of you do already know why it's this way. The people with Christian standards can't understand, I'm gonna list some of the things. They don't understand why these people did these things that we, you'd never do them. Why did they do them? So I'll just, I'll mention a few of them because there's only a few of them to, to mention. <laughs> we're, we're talking about a period of 20, at this point, about 2,700 years. That's longer than it was since Jesus was here. So we're talking a long time. He's got to, you know, five or six things that we can tell you about. Why you could tell more in a day, just in your community, you could name more than these things in a day. There was Noah, he became drunk. He didn't drink to get drunk. 
planted a vineyard, the grape juice ferments in your belly, and you can be filled up with fresh grape juice and get drunk from it a little later. So that's what happened to him. He lay uncovered in his tent. Now, a person in Christ would not do something like that. Seeing Sarah, seeing that she had, God had promised Abraham would have a son, and she was barren from the, from the first time she was mentioned. She was barren, never could have children. She told Abraham to take Hagar, who was her handmaiden, servant, and have a child through her, and it would be Sarah's child by proxy, which was something the practice. Now, Christian never do that. We'd, we'd, throw, we'd throw you out of the church if you did something like that. We'd send you packing. We would, because it's not right. Now, I'm going to tell you why. Lot, he was in Sodom. Remember, they were Sodom, a whole city was Sodomites. The psychiatrists have told us to say homosexual. I don't like that word. It's a psychological word. And the men of the city surrounded the house and wanted to have relation with two men that visited Lot, who happened to be angels, disguised as men. And Lot told him, he offered him his daughters. He said, my daughters have never known a man. Don't monkey with these men here. Take my daughters. See, now a Christian would never, never do something like that. To him, that was better than sodomy. Yeah. Incidentally, they didn't, these were sodomites. They weren't interested in women. <laughs> and I have an idea, Lot knew that. Fearing that uh, their father, remember when Lot escaped from Sodom, God burned Sodom and Gomorrah up. He told Lot and, the, and his wife and daughters, get out of there. Do it now. Don't even look back because it's going to be terrible. Lot's wife looked back, and she was turned to a pillar of salt. And uh, Lot never looked back. She must have been behind her. They just they kept on going to the city, the Zoar, landed there safely. And our daughter, two daughters got to talking about this. How's our dad going to have offspring? Because the family tree now was important in these yeah. days. How's our father going to have children when the mom's gone? Ain't nobody here. So they conceived of this plan that they give their Lot wine to drink He'd get drunk, and then they would be with him, and he'd have children through them. And, and this did happen. And the Moabites and Ammonites were the two groups of people born out of that. Now, I see a Christian would never do something like that. Out of fear, twice Abraham said Sarah was his sister, which technically she was. They both had the same father, but not the same mother. Isaac, out of fear... He said Rebecca was his sister. He said the same thing. Out of fear, Rebecca talked Jacob into pretending like he was Esau and to get the blessing, the family blessing, the firstborn blessing. She did it because God told her Jacob was going to rule over Esau, but it, things didn't look like it was working out, so she, she made this plan. He did get the blessing. Tamar, our most recent incident, who was scheduled to marry one of Judah's sons, and God killed the first two sons of Judah because they were wicked men. She heard that Judah was coming to shear sheep, and he'd forgotten to give her his other son, which he said he'd do, and so she dressed up. It doesn't say she dressed up like a harlot, but evidently that's what happened. She sat by the side of the road where Judah was coming, and Judah turned into her, and he had a child through Tamar, and lo and behold, this is the child that's in Christ's genealogy, Pharez. Now, see, a, a Christian woman would, <laughs> wouldn't do something like that. Now, with the exception of Noah becoming drunk, all of these were the result of human conclusions. P 
people thought through their circumstances and this that God hadn't given them any answer in it. They they didn't hear from God on this. They didn't they didn't have a Bible. There wasn't any prophet around. Very God had revealed very little of himself to the people. Whatever knowledge they had is probably what we would call intuitive. They kind of had a sense of what was right and wrong, but it was very general. And in in that framework, there without little revelation, little knowledge of God, God only appeared to a few of them, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph in a dream. This spans hundreds of years now. This isn't like a week. So they had very little to work with. Like, how would you think if you didn't have a Bible? How would you think? How would you be able to determine what was right and wrong? You might have a sense of it. I understand that. But when you work, when you work the thing out, <laughs> it's amazing that this is all we read about. What you see here, men really can't think right when God doesn't speak with them. These are the best. This is the best of the human race you've been reading about. And they're thinking they just, they weren't like rebels. They weren't against God. They weren't trying to do something wrong. They weren't trying to fulfill their lust. This is just they didn't, couldn't think the thing out because they hadn't been given much information, all right? Now take a big leap and transport yourself into the 20th, 21st century. You've got church people that don't know as much as these men know. They go to church, they hear preaching, they take trips together, and they know less about God than these people knew. Do you wonder why stupid things happen to people like that? Why they make blunders, why they marry the wrong people, go to the wrong places, do the wrong thing. Do you wonder why? God's made man so man can't really think thoroughly and consistently without having an association with them, with God through Christ. That's the way man's made. He's demonstrating that in these texts. God had never told anybody to this point about his eternal purpose, what the overall master plan. He never told Never told anybody. So what is seen here is a lack of revelation impairs your aptitude to think. Amen. So let's say that you're let's say that you're a Christian that you you don't read the Bible much, you don't know much about the Bible. You are gonna make so many mistakes it'll make your head swim. That's just the way it's gonna be. We we hope this isn't the case, but listen, I've lived long enough, I know, I know this is the way it is. That's why the people of God have to be informed, they have to be edified, they have to be taught right, they have to sit under right teaching, they have to expose themselves to the word of God, they have to do it. Amen. If I don't want to do it, then you're shut up, confined to this way of thinking that you'll never be able to think deep enough to keep yourself out of trouble and to keep yourself satisfied. You'll never be able to do it. Even if you have the best retirement plan and hospital plan, you will still not be able to handle life. God's made us that way. Also to consider in this, God never intended for man to live without this knowledge we're talking about. But sin had done such a number on the human race, it took a long time for God, work, this is God working now, it took a long time to get man to the point where he could listen and think and have God as the center of his thought. It took a long time for people, that's what sin did to the human race. You see how rapidly it spread at the time of Noah and the flood, this is roughly about 1600 years into the history of the world. The earth is covered with violence. Every man did what was his thoughts, his imagination of his heart was evil continually. Things were just out of control. That's what happened. God was silent during that period. God was silent. God didn't reveal anything, anything to anybody. 
We are only th the only thing you know about Adam, who he lived almost a millennium. He lived 930 years, and the only thing you know about him is that he committed this sin that plunged the human race into sin. There's no record of God talking anymore to him or revealing anymore to him. And she thinks, so without, without having an understanding of God, some measure of understanding of God, mankind begins to go down. <coughs> now then, that's the reason for salvation, because to what salvation in Christ Jesus, God has a new creation. Yeah. It's called a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17. He's he going to start a new race. Yeah. That's what he's doing, because the, the old race through Adam is unsalvageable. Amen. God doesn't have anything to work with. It's got, it's got, it's ro It's rotten. And so in the new, in Christ, in the new creation, the new covenant, man becomes a new creature or a new creation. He imparts to him the divine nature. So man has attributes of God. At, they go above like intelligence and sensitivity and emotion. It goes beyond that. Everybody's got that. But he brings it so men can think like God. They can look at a situation according to their level of their understanding of God. They can look at a situation and come up with the same conclusion God did. That's what God's doing in redemption. Why? Why, why is he doing it? Well, in the end, he's going to take his people and they're going to live. They're going to be with him or he's going to be with them. And so there ain't going to be anybody go there that's unacquainted with God. <laughs> forget him. Just forget that. That's not going to happen. That's what this salvation's all about. It's getting you ready to get out of here. Because the world's going to be burned up. Yeah. Not going, he, tell, he tells you right up front, it's going to pass away. Don't be anchoring yourself here. Now then why did God put up with this before? He was, is it that sin didn't aggravate God and sin didn't affect God and so he just overlooked all? The scriptures say, Acts 17.30, he winked. That's to say he he didn't look at it. Now there's people, pulpit people, that look at these transgressions that I just mentioned. And they find fault with these patriarchs, just as though they had a body of knowledge like they have. Now here's God. God winked. He passed over it because he knew I'm going to, I made arrangements. I made arrangements. I'm going to send my son into the world. I'm going to, I'm going to cover their sin. Jesus is going to cover their sin. You're going to go backward and cover their sin. So I'm going to, I'm going to wink. I'm going to pass over this now. <laughs> but Paul said in Acts 17, 31, God's not winking anymore. He said the times this God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. So he's not, he's not winking anymore. He's not overlooking it anymore. I know, I know the church does, but he doesn't. Yes, dear. Given, it's interesting how someone will look and, and see, like David, who we know of one situation, yeah. and it was bad, and they'll point oh, yeah. that out, but then they'll say, but don't, don't you judge me. This is how the all day long is. Don't judge me. But see, like you said, this is now we have more information. Yeah. And we don't know anything else that David did except for God said he had a heart. For, he had. Oh he, yes. He had a heart. He did it once. Yeah. Yeah. This, I, I faced that when I was in the manufacturing world. And this is what I would tell people. I say, all right. See, I, I, I said, you're a pretender, number one. You're not, you're not for real. That's what you're talking to. Me. I can see right through you, just like it's a pane of glass. But let's say that you were a king. You don't have kings in the United States. People don't know what a king is. You were a king. You could do anything you wanted, whenever you wanted. How many trips will you have made to Bathsheba's house? Oh, yeah, they all say, oh, why don't and I say, yeah, you, that tells the whole story right there. 
He didn't know what you know, but as soon as he found out, he stopped that. Yeah. Now, something else that we're seeing here in his record is that the heavens rule. <clears throat> God is with Judah. Judge, but then defend judgment. Because yeah, really, what, be they're, judged. <laughs> what, what they're doing is saying this, this, and that is wrong with that person, but they can't see clearly because they have a plank in their eye yeah. trying to point out a speck in someone else's. So when yeah. flesh defends judgment, maybe they shouldn't really be judging other people if they don't want themselves to be judged. Yeah, they'll be judged with the same major of judgment. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now, I'm quick to say this does not mean God condoned what those people did. Doesn't mean that at all. It means because he, he didn't look at it and pay attention to it, because if he would have, it would have been a different story. Now, he did look at Sodom. See, there's even even in this winking, there's a, there's a line. If you cross over it, the fire comes down anyway. There's, there's, just, there's just so much God can put up with. Now, there's something else I wanted to see here, too, that, that in all of this, we've on that God, the heavens rule, God's running things. His purpose always works out. Man's doesn't. Yeah. Now, now, let me illustrate this. In the beginning, Cain was the first man born. Eve thought this is the one God promised. I've got a man from the Lord. He, she thought this was like the Savior. <laughs> Evidently, Satan did too. So as soon as Abel was born, and it became, to, it became apparent that God favored Abel over Cain. Cain kills Abel. But God's will prevailed. And Seth was born to take Abel's place. It's categorically stated in Genesis 4.25. When iniquity became so prominent, God said, that's it. I'm going to destroy all flesh, even the animals. Yeah. I'm going to destroy everything. But God's will prevailed, and he saved a family of eight. Amen. Yeah. And there's a lot more people in the world at Noah's day than there is today. Yeah. People think the world's crowded now. <laughs> now, we went through this a little bit. About 1,600 years. Let's say that the human race started out with Adam and Eve. Let's say the human race doubled every year. Once a year, the race doubled. Now, I took the time to work this out. If you doubt it, work it out. We understand there be a lot of deaths, but people lived, you know, six, seven, eight, nine hundred years. Not counting the deaths, doubling the race every day for 1,600 years, that amounts to one trillion people and if you wonder how much a trillion is try and count that high see they didn't have water like they got now the oceans and all this this was a result of the flood the, it was all livable earth was all livable man multiplied quickly so that's right thinking about this you know it would have been unjust for God to completely annihilate the race in Noah's time. That's right. Because he made a commitment to Eve. That's right. And he couldn't do it. Now, and if you go back even further, he made a commitment to his son. Yeah. Christ was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So, in his genius, that's what he does. He saves one man. Yeah. Now, he still kept his promise. The lineage is pure. Oh, yeah. And yet, he still deals with this, that's right. this, Amen. this thing. Anyway, we'll pass over that. When man aspired to make a name for themselves after the flood, <clears throat> everybody in the world spoke the same language. They are perfectly joined together. There were no factions, no divisions, no sects. None of that existed. And they conspired together to build a city and a tower. God didn't like it because they were making a name for themselves. Their purpose didn't prevail. God's purpose prevailed. Amen. So he confused their speech so they couldn't understand each other, and then they split up. Same thing as <laughs> same thing has happened today in the religious world. 
So you start, people started making a name for themselves. God confuses so one church fellow doesn't understand what the other church person's saying. One Christian doesn't understand what the other person's saying. God's done this, see? Yes. Why? Because his purpose is going to prevail. Man's yeah. is not. Amen. When God announced to Abraham, <clears throat> you're going to have a son to your son. I'm going to bless the world. Abraham is impotent mm -hmm. and Sarah is barren. Yeah. But God's purpose prevailed. Yeah. When Rebecca, Isaac's wife, was found to be barren and it seemed hopeless, the will of God prevailed. When the one through whom God would bring the Savior to the world had an inferior birth, Jacob, he had an inferior birth, he's number two, and yet the prophecy is that the, that's, that's the one through whom the Savior would come is going to be number one, God's will prevailed even under that condition. When Laban sought to take advantage of Jacob, changed his wages 10 times, deceived him about his wife, God's will prevailed. When all manner of confusion broke out with Judah, <laughs> the record you read, it's, it's, uh, I won't go over, it's a terrible record. But God's will prevail. See, what God purposes is going to prevail. It is going to do it. And so your job is get on board. Amen. Okay, there's no way you can lose if you're with Christ. Amen. No way at all. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, he was not suggesting God's will being done solely dependent on the prayers of the people. He wasn't saying, now, if you don't pray, God's will won't be done. But, but there are people that preach this. They should be deprived of their salary. They should. This is, a, this is not true. This is demeaning to God. What he's saying is, you better see this. When you say, thy will be done on earth, it doesn't mean if we don't pray, it won't be done. He's saying... You won't advantage from it if you don't know yeah. that God's will is what ultimately is done in the world. Amen. God's not glorified by a supposed saved people who remain fundamentally ignorant of him. Yeah. This brings no glory to God at all. It's a shame and a disgrace. And he's demonstrating this. See, in all this Genesis record, these are like cases that you would, how's God going to work out, work that out? Well, he did because his purpose is, is inviolable. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's going to be done. Mm -hmm. All right, now our text begins. Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. <coughs> Now, the sale of Joseph occurred, as you might remember, in Dothan. Originally, Joseph was sent out by his father to find his brothers who were keeping the sheep, find out how they were doing. They'd moved the flock. They were in Shechem. They moved the flock northward to, to Dothan. Now, they just did it because they were better grazing land. You know? <laughs> That's why they did it. See, God was in this. God knew yeah. that a caravan's way coming through Dothan, not Shechem, Dothan. And Jacob and Joseph was going to get a free ride down into Egypt. Amen. That's why this all worked out like this. Now, the, so, uh, Solomon talked about God working like this. Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is the Lord. Now, we don't cast lots today, but casting lots is you, there's a situation that comes up and you don't know how it's to be turned out. So 50 people are there, 25 people have a white stone, little pebble, 25 people have a black stone, and, they, and it means yes or no, they just told me yes or no. So they cast the lot, then they tally up the stones and whoever, the white ones win or the black ones win. Now here's what he says, but the, the lot, this stuff from the Amplified Bible, the lot's cast into the lap, or right, it looks like it depends on how you vote. That's it. 
Let's get out and vote now. Everybody bring your white rocks. Come on. Make this thing turn out. See, it's cast into the lamp. It looks like it depends on what they do. But, Solomon says, the decision is holy of the Lord. Even the events that had that seem accidental are really ordered by him. That's how the Amplified Bible. <laughs> this is how God works. God just dumps the decision in your lap. Nobody can make up your mind for you. You've got to do it. You don't know of anyone smart enough to give you a good answer. You just face your backs against the wall. This is how God works, people. He puts the lot right down there in your lap. He's going to work it out. But the only way you're going to see it is to put your heart into the thing and think it out and do the best you can. God creates circumstances in which men have to do something. Now, fortunately, the bulk of my learning in this has already, I'm still learning it, but the bulk of it, I've, I've passed that. <laughs> Having to learn that every day type thing. But you can't remain apathetic when it comes to the things of God. You can't live as though your soul's not important and what God thinks about you is not important and what's going to happen to you when you die, that that's not important. You can't, you can't live that way. But the world's trying to make you live that way because the devil's working through the world. He's trying to make you think you need this, you need that, you got to do this, you got to do that. And you've got to focus on, you're going to eventually, all of you and myself, are eventually going to stand before God. Yeah. And you're, you're going to be faced with the facts concerning you. No varnish. No dumbed down words. No politeness. You're going to face, if it's good, you'll be praised. If it's bad, you'll be damned. Serious business. You're learning that in Genesis. You learned it. Everybody who mistreated God's people, they got, they paid. But it wasn't the people that were abused that wreaked their revenge. It was God. God who did it. Now Potiphar buys uh, Joseph. Now we don't have an economy like this, but the world, a good part of the world still operates with this kind of economy. They buy slaves. They used to be in our country too. Yeah. Now he happens to be one of Pharaoh's officers, and he's a captain of the guard. He's what he's a head of the prison system. Now God's orchestrating these events, see, yeah. so that he's gonna he's gonna get Joseph down into Egypt in a position where he's close to Pharaoh, so when the time comes, you don't have to send across the country and try and bring him in. He's gonna be right, right at hand. See, this is what's happening here. Amen. Now, let me, let me show you how God has orchestrated everything together. Now, I'll just give you the bare facts that's happened concerning Joseph at this point. Joseph's brothers were shepherds, but they were of the seed of Abraham. There was a, when, uh, Joseph went out to find his brother. There was an ma unnamed man met him in Shechem and said, who are, you, who are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for my brothers. And this fellow knew where they were. That was, he, was a plant, he was planted there Amen. by God. See, God's orchestrating this whole thing. Then there's, uh, the brothers decide to kill Joseph. Now, God's managing this whole thing. So he, one of his older brothers, Reuben, says, no, 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 no. let's don't kill him. Let's, let's throw him in this pit. Think this thing over. Let's not shed any. This is God raised Reuben up to do this. Then when they were getting ready to take him out, Judah comes along, and he's not in agreement with the brothers to kill. They, they concocted a scheme. We'll leave, him in the scheme. we'll leave him in that pit. Then we'll, we'll take his coat, this coat of many colors. that We just loathe the fact that Dad gave him that coat. And we'll kill our animal and dip that coat in blood, and then we'll give the blood-soaked garment to Dad, and Dad will think that he's been killed by an animal. So they, they had thought this all out, what they're going to do. But Judah, he's raised up by God. Judah says, no. Why should we do this have blood on our hands? Let's sell him. Let's leave him in a bit. Then secretly, Judah was planning on coming back, maybe the nighttime sometime, and 
lift him out of that pit and take him home to dad. He God raised him up. Now while all this is going along pretty soon, there's a band of Ishmaelites, a caravan, they're, tra they're traveling along where they're at. Here comes this caravan. And then there's some Midianites that have to do with they buy and sell. They're descendants of one of Abraham's sons. God, remember, God's orchestrated this whole thing. So they decide to sell them, make a little profit. God sent that caravan. Jacob, he's in the mix. He's one of the ones to whom the promise of Messiah was given. He thinks Joseph's dead. He gets this blood-soaked garment. He thinks he's dead. Uh, this lasted for some years. Thought he was dead. Next time he saw me, he was well over. He was over thirty. And he was seventeen when he left. So it was. God was in this. See, God setting this thing up, yeah. so he'll not have any trouble at all getting Jacob down into Egypt. He's got to get Jacob into Egypt, because the nation of Israel is going to come from Jacob. Yeah, right. he, and so they got to get down there to Egypt. God already told Abraham they're going to go down into this country, and he got to get them down there. So now if Joseph's in there, he'll be able to get his dad down in there. Then thrown into the mix as Potiphar, God raised him up. God made sure he was the first one to spot Joseph and brought him, not somebody else. Maybe someone from Assyria would have been there at the slave block. Who would ever have assembled a group of people like I just named? Who would ever have assembled a group of people like that to carry out a purpose? Yeah. <laughs> See, only God could do something yeah. like, like this. Now, believe me, in your life, you've got, there's a bunch of people that have enabled you to be where you're at. Yeah. Yeah. And you could probably figure out a lot of them if you think about it, but God is the one that put this whole thing <clears throat> together. He still works this way, bringing his chosen ones to himself. Now, also, we want to see how the God's working behind the scenes. This is just not a nice Bible story that we tell the kids. In fact, the scriptures tell us <coughs> it comes up higher now. You've got to get up a little higher to see this. i got to remember when I was in the manufacturing world, we'd go to New York. <coughs> you fly over New York. It doesn't look anything up there like it does on the ground. I mean... It, you can't even tell what's the Empire State Building. You can't. You can't tell. So this, there's things of God. You have to get up. Got to get up high yeah. to see them. And the scriptures tell us that Psalm 105, verse 17. He sent a man before them, even Joseph who was sold for a servant. All right, that's a bird's eye view of what really happened. It looked like his brothers captured him, his brothers sold him, Potiphar bought him. When I get behind the scene, God sent him. Yeah, amen. <laughs> yeah. Do you have enough faith to see that God's got you where you're at? Yeah. I mean, can you accept something like that? Yeah. See, well, this is hard for me to accept something like, well, work on it a little bit. Yeah. You probably have some things in your past. You get, thank God they're not happening anymore. But look at them from this angle. Yeah. Uh -huh. You'll find out God has equipped you for this moment. Yeah. If maybe you tended to be a little bit naive about people, he's run you through the mills. You found out, hey, people can be bad. Yeah. Right. You don't have to learn that in Sunday school. You, you learn it firsthand. See, God still is working with people. By now, he's, he's sold to a slave, slave owner. But it says, and the Lord was with Joseph. There, well, that, cha that, now that changes the whole picture now. He's a young man, never been away from home that we know about. Here he is in Egypt, down there at the market where they're selling and buying slaves. I mean, it must have been a kind of a uneasy situation, to say the least. I don't know that God said out of heaven, I'm with you, Joseph, but he's telling us that. He told us more than he told Joseph. God is with him. He's with Joseph. Stephen drew attention to this when he preached in the Jewish synagogue in Acts 7. He drew attention to this. 
Acts 7, verse 9. The patriarchs, that's Joseph's brothers, moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. Yes. <laughs> can, you, uh, can you believe that God's with you? Think it over now. I'm, I'm assuming that you're in Christ. God was with him. Oh, he's with you more than he was with Joseph. Yeah. He's got more of a reason to be with you. You're in Christ. God was with him. Amen. What's it mean for the Lord to be with somebody? There's several people in the scripture that says God is with them. When Ishmael was growing up, Genesis 21, 20 says, God was with him. Uh, for Abraham's sake. He told Abraham because he's your son. I'll bless him. Joshua 6, 7 says God was with Joshua who took Israel into Canaan. God is with the tribe of Judah. Judges 1, 19. God is with the house of Joseph. Judges 1, 22. God is with the judges. When they raised up the judges, they were like something like kings. God is with them. God is with Samuel, 1 Samuel 3.19. God is with David, 1 Samuel 18.12. God is with Solomon, 2 Chronicles 7, 18, uh, 2 Chronicles 1.1. 1, 1. God is with Hezekiah, 2 Kings 18.1. Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, God is with him. He is with Jehoshaphat. He is with Asa. He is with, now these are statements that categorically says he's with him. He is with John the Baptist and he was with the Lord Jesus said he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed to the devil because God was with him. Yeah. <laughs> now the idea has several marvelous uh, perspectives. I'll explain now what, what's involved in God being with somebody. And I hope he's with you. Yeah. First, the powers of darkness, including Satan, are held at bay. Yeah. God's with you, Satan, and his henchmen can't do what they want to do. Amen. Contradicting and hostile men can't have their way with you. May look like they do. No, if God's with you, they, they can't have their way against you. God would work the circumstances around the people he's with. He'll work the circumstances around them for their good. He'll make things turn out. Certain men would be inclined to them. God's for you, or pretty soon be Someone will be attracted to you. They'll, they'll bless you, they'll provide for you. They'll do so. That's because God's with you. And we won't want to forget the angels of the Lord camps round about them to deliver them from evil. See, there's a lot of things involved in God being with you. But there's a lot in it. God was with him. Now, if a person's abiding in Christ and living by faith, God will be with him. You can believe that. Doesn't seem like it. God's, we sing this song, God be with you yes. till we meet again. Well, it's a good heart song, isn't it? And what happened? God is with him. What happened? Joseph was a prosperous man. Now, he's a man. He's just really a young boy, but he's a man. Yeah. Like he, what he had to take a man to be where he was at. Take an old, only an older man could get as far as he did because God, God is with him, see? Yeah. God doesn't take a long time for God to make something of somebody. Right. Became a prosperous man. This doesn't emphasize a personal stash of wealth that he had. He was a slave. Yeah, right. <laughs> but it was saying is everything he did yeah. prospered. If Potiphar put money in his hand, it earned good interest. Yeah. Put a flock in his hand, and herd increased. Put something in the field in his hand, good crop. Whatever, whatever he put in his hand. Now, uh, you want to be that kind of employee. Amen. You want to be the kind of employee. You can be, too. You have to live close to God for this to happen. That whatever you do, it'll prosper. Yes. Not uh, for Pharaoh, uh, Potiphar, it prospered for Potiphar. And what do you think? The Potiphar noted this. Yeah. The Egyptians were religious men. They were they worshipped idols, but Potiphar noticed, oh, the Lord's with him. Everything he does, man, everything he does 
works out. I don't have any problems with Joseph. I don't have to correct him. or Everything he does prospers. So, That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, amen. Whatever they attributed to. He reasoned upon Joseph's success. He knew this can't just be because he's smart. It, this, <laughs> there's more involved here than that. The Egyptians, with all other heathen, appeared to sense there was a supreme God. You'll find this in many incidents in Scripture, where uh, Jonah was in the fi in the ship and it was tossing to and fro you know they said to pray to your god maybe your god will hear you they kind of had a sense of a supreme being i've heard uh, men who have dealt with tribal type people have said that all of them know there's there's really one true god but they don't know who it is and so they settle for lesser gods and so they, a good missionary will say, but I, I know who the supreme God is. I know who the supreme God is. And every time it piques their interest. When Joseph appeared before Pharaoh and said, God has told you what he's about to do. Pharaoh didn't say, don't bother me with your religious superstition. Right. <laughs> Just tell me. Yeah. yeah. He didn't say that at all. No. Heavenly yeah. yeah, given, it appears that from the text that Potiphar um, like tested this and put him on different projects oh, yes. to Amen. see whether or not because yeah. one person may be good at doing one thing but when they're good at doing all things yeah, that yeah. 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 Amen. Yeah. Amen. that's the kind of thing that Potiphar confronted Yeah. a successful believer in God he had many houses and lands because he was as I said he was a slave but whatever he did, you want to be the kind of employee that your your brother B or sister C, and the boss says, "Let's give that let's give that to brother B and sister C," because yeah, right. I I notice that whatever they do it, Amen. this can happen to you. I I can t I can testify firsthand about this. This this actually did happen to me, so this can happen. And I'll tell you, it makes all the difference in the world if you work with this in mind. Yes. Work kind of becomes kind of pleasant. Amen. Then the you remember Jesus uh, talk, talked about something. Then the world will know yeah. when they see something. Jesus prayed that they all may be one as Thou Father art in me and I, and thee, that the world may believe that Thou hast sent me. John seventeen. Father, I'm praying that all all of your people will be united. They'll be all be one. Then the world will believe. You did you did send me. You really did send me. And I'll tell you something now. This will not happen as long as the church is divided. Yeah. He's just whistling in the dark. Yeah. Most missions are a waste of time. Yeah. The truth, I'm telling you the truth. I don't like it, but that's that someone's gotta say it. Not many others are saying it. That's how Jesus prayed that they all may be one in order that the world will believe you sent me. Why don't people run to Christ? Why do they stand back from a, a godly group of people? Because they don't believe God sent Christ. Or oh, they intellectually, I understand, they know the Bible says that, but they don't believe it. If you believe that God, the Almighty One, sent Christ to save you, you'll beat a path to him. That's what will happen. She's like, oh, God even works on this basis. See? That's what happened to Jesus when he came, well, people came to him. Hey, John the Baptist, too. They didn't have ads in the paper. You want to hear John the Baptist? You had to go where he was. He didn't come where you were. You had to go where he was. Boy, they did. They flocked out. Cities emptied out. They went out to see him. Jesus, he'd be preaching by a seaside. Man, the people would turn up. He'd be on a mountain. They'd turn up. Why? He was working the works of God. And this is what happens when the works of God are worked. On the day of Pentecost, they start preaching about the wonderful works of God, and a multitude of people flock into that place. The number of people that believed come to 3,000. There had to be a lot more than that. And why? They saw the wonderful works of God. So if the church gets busy 
and does something and quits all this talking. And I'm not talking about like feeding the poor and stuff like that. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about your life is so different. People know that person's got to be, he got to be a Christian. He just lives different than everybody else lives. That's, that's what will attract him. Potiphar noticed this. and he, So he made Joseph the overseer. The, uh, he managed Potiphar's house, which wasn't uh, like a five-room bungalow. Now, you want to see the parallel of this to Christ. God has made Jesus ruler over everything. He's put everything into his hand. He said, the Father loves me and has given everything into my hand. The house belongs to God, but Jesus is managing it. Yes, amen. And if you want to get along with God, hey, you've got to walk with Jesus. Because yes, he's running the house. Perfect parallel, you see. God's demonstrated that. Like Potter, for those who are convinced of this, will uncoerced, eagerly put what they have in Christ's hands. Yeah. If they can see whatever Jesus does prospers, I'm going I'm to put my job in his hand. Yeah. I'm going to put my children in his hand. Right. I'm going to put my husband, my wife in his hand. I'm going to take all my belongings, I'm going to put it in his hands. Because he says, the promises of the Lord will prosper in his hand. That's Isaiah 53. Uh -huh. See, if you believe this, you Potiphar believed this, so he acted upon it. Yeah. Men believe it. What happened to Christ? They'll act. They'll act upon it. Made him overseer. Came to pass from the time from the time that he was made he made him overseer. So there's a point in time that the Lord blessed Potiphar's house for Joseph's sake. <laughs> now, now this is an interesting line of thinking. Can can God bless a place or a person because of somebody else? Yeah. Well, we're going to show yes. Uh -huh. Yes, he can. There's an aspect of divine nature that could be understood a lot more than it is at this time. Mm -hmm. Let me give you some examples. One time God told Abraham he was going to destroy Sodom. And Abraham was thinking about Lot, who was living there. And he pled with God, will you destroy the city for, for the sake of 50? Uh, he's asking him to consider sparing the city because of a limited number of people. And God said, I'll, I'll spare it for 50. He couldn't find 50. 40? Couldn't find 40. 30? Couldn't find 30. Finally got down to 10. Couldn't find 10. But he reasoned with God. Think about, oh, let's bring it down to today. Let's say that we sense that things are going awry in the nation. We should pray, God, save the nation yeah. for your people's sake. Amen. See, this is how you pray. This is how God is. The Lord told Isaac, I'll bless you for my servant Abraham's sake. I'm blessing you because I ain't your dad, Abraham. Laban said to him, I know the Lord's blessed me for your sake to Jacob because Laban's flocks are increasing, increasing. Laban would say, hey, I know. It isn't because I'm a good manager. He's blessing my flocks for your sake. David was determined. He, when Jonathan died, was killed, he said, I want to know if there's anyone left in Jonathan's house. Anyone in, in Saul's house. I want to do good for him for Jonathan's sake. Yeah. Yeah. God allowed Solomon to maintain his kingship after his death, even though he was, he was a bad man when he died. He said, I'm going to spare you your kingdom for my servant David's sake, for his sake. God said he'd defend Jerusalem. 2 Kings 19.34, I'll defend Jerusalem for David's yeah. sake. Amen. See? It's a big city. David is one man. We're being introduced to God here. See, God is showing you, look, I know things are bad, but you get close to me, you walk with me, and I can bless because of you. Amen. I can change circumstances for your sake. Yeah. 
Because I love you, because I'm for you, I'll change your environment because of you. Amen. Oh, yeah, I like to hear this. Uh, I like to hear this kind of thing. There's a song we used to sing when I was younger. It's called Make Me a Blessing. I, I write it out for you there. But make me a blessing. Remember he said to Abraham, I'll make you a blessing. I'll bless you and make you a blessing. So here you've got Joseph. The, the uh, grandson, and he's bl he's blessed Potiphar for Joseph's mm -hmm. sake. Trace to its ultimate cause, the increase of a believer is not because of them, it's because of Jesus. See, you got to make, make the transition. It's for Jesus' sake. He, well, the scriptures tell us that he has forgiven us for Christ's sake. And he said, it goes on to say, he, he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. You know, he had no idea what his assets were, how big his flock was. He only knew what was on his plate. That was it. Now, that's confidence. That's the kind of confidence that God has in Christ. Amen. If you'll stick with Christ and you'll follow Christ, and you obey Christ, and you don't displease him, God will bless you for Christ's sake. Amen. He'll do it. God, the difference, the parallel sort of breaks down because God does know what he, God knows what he has, but the idea is he's entrusted it all into Christ's hands. <laughs> Uh, he turns attention to Joseph. He says, Joseph was goodly and well-favored. Handsome young man and well-built. That's what it means. Here's how some of the other versions say, well-built and handsome and handsome and good-looking, very beautiful in form and face, of a beautiful form and a beautiful countenance, an attractive person, fine-looking. It means he had a, a good face and a good body. Everything kind of going for him. Of course, that can be a handicap, as we'll find out. We'll find that outward appearance can be a liability. Oh, yeah, and they've got a nice appearance. There are certain kind of people they attract. Yeah. Now, we don't glory in people being homely and ugly and all that. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying if you are an attractive person, many of our brothers and sisters, almost all of them, I better say all of them, are, are attractive people. But don't count on you getting a good deal because you're good looking. Because the wrong kind of people are attracted to that. You have an inner beauty that you want to attract people. Now, it's not wrong to be attractive. I think we all understand that. I'm glad I was able to marry an attractive wife. He told a story of a man who had two choices of women that he could marry. One was one of these, you know, very beautiful woman, and the other was uh, was very talented, but she she wasn't a lot to look at, you know. But he chose the talented woman. And the first morning he woke up, he looked at his wife and said, "Please start singing." Yeah, you don't want to have those kind of values. You don't. There have been some very attractive people that have felt fallen on at very difficult times and their whole countenance was changed. They became disfigured and those that really loved them kept on loving them. Some of the other versions, uh, they tell us is that there are other people that were described as beautiful in scripture. Rachel is described the same way, in the same words. Beautiful in appearance and, and comely in form. Say, the same language was said of Rachel. David is also said, described as a beautiful, with beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. Abigail was a woman of good understanding and a beautiful countenance. 
Bathsheba was very beautiful to look upon. Esther is described as fair and beautiful. So there's people in the scripture that are very attractive, very attractive people. But they did not depend on their attractiveness to gain the advantage. In fact, Esther was a steward of her attractiveness. She used her attractiveness to save Israel, the Jews. <laughs> Now, a res a respons Joseph has a responsibility. He's attractive, handsome. All right, now that means that tests are on the way. There are going to be some tests to determine, are you going to let this situation, you're successful, you're handsome, you've got a good build, are you going to let this turn you aside? So there's some tests. Responsibility brings tests. Well, here's, here's his test. Came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. She said, talk about being brazen. Lie with me. But he refused. He said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not, doesn't, doesn't worry about what is with me in the house. And he committed all that he hath with my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How, can, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And she didn't drop the matter. It came to pass that she spake to Joseph day by day. He hearkened not to her to lie by her or to be with her. Now, the reality and nature of moral stability is declared in this text. I can't begin to tell you, I don't even want to talk about it, but about the number of preachers that have fallen into the snare of immorality. It's, it's startling. Even people that deal with this are staggered by the number of much, how much immorality is in the ministry. It's absolutely mind-boggling. Have you ever seen it? Just thank God, don't look for it. Yeah. It's out there. So I'm showing the, the importance of being morally stable. Amen. Now, the only way you can be morally stable is to live by faith and walk with God. You can't Amen. do it. You, you can do it by sheer willpower and determination. You can go so far and do pretty well for a while. But... But eventually, it'll be your undoing. Yeah. Now, if you transfer this over to the spiritual realm, there are those who are neglecting their great salvation while they're engaged in what we, the scriptures call Babylonian. Yeah. It's erroneous. It's an erroneous religion. It, it comes in the name of Christ, but it's not valid. It can't sustain a person's faith. People fall apart right there in a church. They fall apart. Their marriages fall apart. Their children go astray. In church, and some of them are officials. What's that telling you? It's in that system. Couldn't sustain them. You know, they're always finding fault. Well, somebody needs to find fault. Even in the world, if you have a disease, you go to someone, where did this come from? Say, well, you've been eating this kind of thing right here. Well, you say, well, I'm going to quit eating that then. Yeah, even, even in the flesh, see, people want to find out what caused this abnormal situation. And if a, person, if a person wears the name Christian, but they're not living 100% for God, this is an abnormality. You, someone's got to find, you got to, if you're in that boat, I hope you're not, but if you're in that boat, you've got to find out why. Why am I so indifferent? How come I can go so long without ever reading the scriptures or praying or seeking the Lord? And I'm going to go a week, two weeks, three weeks, I haven't sought God at all. What, what made me that way? you got to find that out. Yeah. Amen. Can't ask somebody else to find it out for you. you got to do it for yourself. So he, he had, Joseph was strong before this event took place. So he refused. Now, he was just home for the first 17 years of his life. Oh, his dad taught him well. Taught him well. He 
his uh, moral fiber didn't diminish in Egypt. He refused. Yeah. Refuse means no. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do this. I walked in these um, business circles where you're in the upper echelon. And uh, anytime we had meetings, high level meetings, they always served wine. And I wouldn't drink it. You had to turn your glass over like quick. You had to be a quick draw. Turn it over. Quick. So I would. I'd turn it over. So a fellow asked me one time, he says, is, your, is drinking against your religion? I said, no, no. He said, why don't you drink? I said, because it's against my nature. I really hate that. I don't like being around it, and I don't like being around people that do it. You're frank with me, I'm be frank with you. I'm with you. I, I come to these meetings because I'm required to do so, and I don't want to just be a grump, but I'll just confide in you. I hate them, every minute of them. I didn't tell him some of the other stuff I could have told him. Joseph was like this way. His values were established before the event. That's what you got to do. The evil day is going to come now. You're gonna, there's going to come a time in your life when you're especially tested. you got to be ready for it. He refused. Wouldn't yield his ground. Now notice how he reasoned. This is a young man now. He reasoned. My master trusts me with everything. Everything that I have, everything he has is in my charge. Mm -hmm. So he thinks, so this is not appropriate yeah. for someone in that position. He said, there's no one greater in the house than me. He's withheld nothing from me except you. Yeah. I know I, Potiphar does not, has not allowed me to have liberties with you. Mm -hmm. You're excluded. He's, he's thinking this. Thinking out loud, this thing. How could I do this great wickedness? This is wickedness, Mrs. Potiphar. Yeah. Yeah. This is great wickedness yeah. for me to spend time with another man's wife. Yeah. This is great. Remember, he's a young yeah. man, and he doesn't have a Bible. There's no Bible. He's away from home. This would be, this would be the ideal time, you know. Yeah. But he's a man of principle. And sin against God. Now I myself, this to me is a remarkable observation. That in those spiritually primitive times, he considered that sin was against God. Yeah. It's like slapping God's face yeah. or spitting in it. Uh -huh. It was against God. Yeah. Oh, what a... that he was there in that position with that favor because of God. Yes, yes. right. Yes. Amen. That's Amen. right. Sin against God. Mm -hmm. Now, there are places in Scripture where men sinned against men. Mm -hmm. there, there are some cases like that. Man sinned against his brother. So there's, there's things like this. But this is against God. Like men, Numbers 21.5 and other texts say that men spoke against God. They criticized God or they spoke as though what God said wasn't true or they're speaking against God Job 15 13 one of the men said they men turned their spirit against God I mean they turned like turn their back to God take a look at my back I'm not even going to listen to you people have this attitude they don't actually say this but one of the prophets saw men sitting with their back to the sun you remember when the prophet saw this, this vision of these men sitting with their back to the sun, that's there are people that live with their back yeah, yeah. to God. Job fifteen twenty five speaks of stretching out a hand against God, do, deliberately doing something that defames God, fighting against God. Acts five thirty nine the mind being at enmity with God, your, their way of thinking is against. <laughs> against God, replying against God. Romans 9, 20 says, who are you that reply against God? God tells you the way something is, yeah. and you alibi. Yeah. Uh -huh. Like God says to Adam, what have you done? He says, this woman you gave me, it's her. 
this woman you gave me, it's her. He says, well, how about that, Eve? He says, that serpent, it's him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To neither Adam or Eve never did admit they sinned. No, he's the, the, not in the text. Yeah. I think it's there for, for a reason. David, he was so sensitive when he sinned with Bathsheba. He said, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. It's just like there's nobody I'm thinking about right here but God. He actually sinned against Bathsheba and her husband too, but it was, it was against God. That was the preeminent thing, and that's what made everything else wrong. Amen. Can you believe when you're out there are people that still sin against God? They sin against God. Then there's people like Joseph that said, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to sin against Amen. God. I'm not going to do it. You may be the boss's wife, and you may be able to have some things go against me, but I'm not. I'm not going to. It's just unreasonable. Yeah. See, at some point in a person's life, sin has to be unreasonable. Because yeah, right. it is really unreasonable. Yeah. And he hearkened not to her. Came to pass, as she spoke unto Joseph day by day, every day. I, mean, I, can, I, I can only imagine he came to when he dreaded kind of being around there. The text says that he uh, day by day hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. Now, most of the modern versions omit that or to be with her. But it is in the text. In other words, I'm not, I'm not going to not only do I refuse to be intimate with you, I, I'm not going to be around you. Because there's temptation, there's iniquity here. I'm not, See, there are certain places and certain people you gotta like. You gotta like stay away from them. Yeah. Yeah, well, they're my relatives. But stay away. Yeah. Right. The idea of the verse is that Joseph did not want to be alone with her, or in the same room with her. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, this temptation was offensive to him. Yes. Remember, he was, what was she doing by that tree to begin with? Yes, that's right. Amen. And then she entered into this conversation. Amen. That's what the serpent was. Right. With it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now there comes the evil day. That's when temptation reaches a crescendo. It's more difficult than it ever was before. It's a harder test yeah. than before. Uh -huh. Put on the whole armor of God. You may be able to stand, withstand Stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So there's a, Satan has like a special offensive that God allows him to take. This type of teaching wasn't available to Joseph at the time. He seemed to sense that the breastplate of righteousness will keep you. <laughs> if you're an ungodly person, guess what you'll do in temptation? Huh? Ah. You got a worldly mind, fleshly mind, you think about it like the world. Guess what you're going to do in the time of temptation? You're going to cave in. Put on the whole armor of God. The tenacity of Potiphar's wife was something to behold. It's like Delilah. It reminded me of Delilah. Said that uh, Delilah was, she wasn't doing it out of lust, she was doing it for money. Even though Samson in the scriptures say loved her. But she was doing this for, for money. And it uh, says it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. Finally, finally, Samson couldn't take it anymore. Just every day hounding him. You don't love me anymore. It's what she actually told him. You don't love me like you said you did. But finally broke him down. He divulged the secret of his strength. So her, she had this persistence that um, Potiphar's wife had. Testing of the evil day. There may be, there's probably some uh, areas you have to uh, survey your life yourself, but there's probably some areas that you face temptation every day. You just kind of, there it is, in your face all the time. You've got to keep refusing, keep being vexed. Don't, don't cave in. Potiphar's wife is driven by lust. 
and she's, but the devil's behind her strategy. See, the devil's manipulating her like a puppet. He's got her on a string. He's manipulating her. Since the Lord's involved, there's going to be a way of escape from this temptation. We know it. I don't know if, if Joseph knew this precisely, but he said, with every temptation, a way of escape is provided. This is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. A way of escape is provided so you'll be able to bear it. So there's a way out of every temptation. Praise God. Amen. We want to build one another up yes. so you're strong. You can, the time of temptation, you can spot the escape door yes. and get out of there. Amen. If you're dull and you haven't built up your soul and you're not strong in the faith, you'll miss the, you'll miss the door. You'll yeah. miss the escape. Now, it came to pass that um, Joseph was alone in the house. Yeah. No one was there with him. He went in on business. He didn't go in to visit out of his wife. He's going in to do his, his duties because he was a head over the house and in the field. So he had something that required his attention in the house. And she laid a snare for him. She, she's waiting for him when he comes in. Remember, he's the overseer of the house. So he could just have his way around there. I imagine he didn't see part of his wife as soon as he walked in, but I pictured she trapped him some way, got him, got him trapped some way. She, and then she, he was, she was close enough, she grabbed him by the garment, his coat. Some say his sleeve, he, he got a hold of his garment. She said, come, come lie with me. Now, I want to again draw attention to the modesty of which the Holy Spirit portrays this. The actual translation of the words is, lie with me. Yeah. <laughs> See, there's, there's other ways people sought to explain it. Uh -huh. And some of the translations, they're pretty raw, boy. You couldn't like you couldn't read some of these Bible texts to your children. I'm telling you the truth. You don't believe me. I, I gave some of them here. But the Holy Spirit is very modest in the way he states these things so that he doesn't awaken some kind of sinful desire. I think she caught him by the by the skirt, it says, by the bottom of his robe. Seems to see he was either sitting or had postured herself so it, it would be, a, she thought, attractive to him. She believes that Joseph is vulnerable. Just like Satan believed Job was vulnerable. So I know that Satan's thinking this thing. He's thinking, ah, this, this young boy is not as strong as he's letting on. Given the right circumstances, we could just get everybody out of the house. If I can get Potiphar's wife to put her best dress on and really, really make herself up to look really good, I know I can get him. I know I can get him. Because Satan doesn't know everything. So he lays this trap for her. But things she didn't reckon on, she didn't reckon on the fact that Joseph was a God-fearing man. That's the thing she wasn't thinking about. But he was a God-fearing man. He was not a man who said he was God-fearing. He was a God-fearing man. And Satan didn't know of the righteous integrity of, jo of uh, Joseph any more than he knew of the righteous integrity of Job. He doesn't know everything. Satan really doesn't know everything. So Joseph, what are you going to do now, Joseph? Master's wife got it. She got clutched in your garment. What are you going to do? He said, I'm going to slip out of the garment and run out of the door. Yeah, that's, right. that's the way of escape. Yeah. Word fled means to escape. See, that's the idea. Not run with fear, escape from this snare. Yeah. Uh -huh. He knew I can't, I can't say, I'm going to try and win Potiphar's wife to the Lord. He says, don't want to do something like this. Listen, I know people went to bars to try and win people. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah I'm telling you the truth. There's some places you just got to get out. Yeah. Amen. And so he fled as rapidly as he could. Like he, I get the picture, he like disappeared. There he's, he's gone. And quite often, you know, sin is committed because the person just didn't get away soon enough. They, they stuck around too long. Yeah. Yeah. They invited the wrong people over and they just waited too long. He didn't. 
naive people wonder why Christian individuals that have, they have known fell into deep sin. Some of the national evangelists and then say, how did, how did that happen? Preacher Joe has been such a fine man. We, we really learned a lot from him, and he was such a good preacher. And how come he took off with Ralph's wife? What? Well, he wasn't as strong as what you think. He stayed around the temptation too long. Yeah, some of these preachers, just down the road here. Just down the road, one of the churches. Preacher and the youth minister, they're preaching to the person they're having an affair with. They're in the audience. Oh, yeah. What happened? They didn't get out of that situation. They stayed too long. Let's go down to... And what's the coffee shop mean? Starbucks. Let's go down to Starbucks and have a cup of coffee. Yeah, yeah let's well, so you, you got to guide your life yourself. Nobody else can guide it for you. But you have to stay out of compromising Amen. situations. Right. Now, what this really was, <laughs> this was a satanic instituted initiative. This is Satan who knows who Joseph is, the lineage he's in. This is Satan trying to bring Joseph down. He's obviously been granted permission to, to test him like, he, like God granted him permission to test uh, Peter. So he runs out. Mm -hmm. Does that discourage Potiphar's wife? She quickly assesses the situation. I got his coat. Here, I got his garment. I'm going to turn this. Help! <laughs> yeah. And she calls for the servants and tells them, you know, this he blames her husband. Yeah. He brought this Hebrew in to mock us, make fun of us. He tried to take liberty with me and he left his he was dumb enough, folks, he left his coat here. Yeah. See, he she probably had dismissed these very men from the house before Joseph came. Yeah, right. Now she calls them back in. I don't know if any of them put two and two together because I have an idea Joseph wasn't the first man she made this attempt with. Uh -huh. So she calls the man of the house. Well, well presented plan. The, her husband brought this fellow in here. He's a Hebrew. You know how those, you know all those Hebrews are. And he brought this Hebrew in here. And look here what he tried to do. Take liberty of being, I forced it enough. I screamed and scared him away. Since it was a well thought out answer, she she gave the men. Now something to note here is you accept the fact now that Satan is the one promoting both sin and temptation. And you see from from uh, Potiphar's wife's answer that Satan uses strategies, plans, techniques approaches. See, Satan's not like a wild bull charging around. He uses straight, he lays traps and snares. Jesus uh, divulged this to Peter the night he was betrayed. Jesus told his disciples that all of you, the sheep's going to be smitten, the sheep scattered, and all of you are going to go away from me. And Peter said, I'll not. I'll not. <laughs> Not me. And he was not a sort of a sissy type guy. Yeah. And Jesus said, you're going to deny me tonight three times. Then he tells them the background. He says, Satan has desired you. He's asked permission to sift you like wheat. He's going to, try and, he's going to find out what it takes for you to forget all about me. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, Peter was under severe attack that night. Mm -hmm. But Jesus added, but I prayed for you. Yeah. I prayed for you that your faith won't fail. Yeah. And it didn't. It just took a look. Amen. Didn't take a prophet. God didn't send a prophet. He said, I sinned. That's what he did to David. He sent a prophet mm -hmm. to tell David what he did, right? Yeah. And many times in the Old Testament, God would send a prophet to tell a sinful person what they've done. Not here. Not here. 
Here's how sensitive Peter was. His eye caught Jesus' eye. That was the door of escape. He got out of it. Satan failed. <laughs> Satan failed. Faith, Peter's faith wasn't destroyed. Now Potiphar's uh, wife, as I said, cast the blame on him. That's what sinners do. He said, if it had been for you, I would not have done this. It's all your fault. I tried, I tried, but I had to she had to tell a lie. He came into me. No, he didn't come into me, to her. She pursued him, remember? She pursued him and said, he came into me. Because you know, you men know how attractive I am. I mean, I, how could he help but want to come into me, you know? So she lied. She I lifted up my voice. She lied. When she told it to Potiphar, he got angry. Well, that tells me a little bit about Potiphar. She implemented a strategy that, that was to allow her to, to have the gain. And it's going to look like she won. It's going to, for several years, it's going to look like she won. But she didn't. Joseph was put in prison, <coughs> and he is uh, laid in irons, chained him up. 105th Psalm says this in verse 18, whose feet they hurt with fetters, painful, shackles on him. The New Revised Standard Version says his feet were hurt with fetters and his neck was put in a collar of iron. Just like a dog on a leash in prison. All because of a lie. Yeah, that's right. Doesn't look right, does it? But it was testing time. Yeah. In all this, Joseph's getting stronger. Yeah, amen. Joseph's becoming more resolved. This is a weakening in him at all. He's going to be ready. Amen. He's going to be ready for his work. Because he's going to be made the head of the head of the country, you know. He's going, to, he's going to have to be able to survive people. Very brief period of time before the prison keeper noticed <laughs> everything Joseph does, he prospers. He turned over the prisoners to Joseph. He's got irons, shackles, collar around the neck. He's in shackles, but he's the head of all the prisons, and nobody did anything in prison, it says, without his permission. Amen. That's God. See, God was with him. That's what it God, but God was with him. Not to get him out of the circumstance, to sustain him in the circumstance. Because as a testimony, God wants proof to the world. Yeah. He wants the world to see it. I keep from falling those who trust in me. Yeah. But he's got to demonstrate that to somebody. Some, someone has to see that. That's yeah. where you come in. <laughs> you can see it. <laughs> God was with Joseph. All the prisoners in his hand. Why? Everything was going smooth. The prison was evidently going pretty smooth. It says, because the Lord is with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it prosper. That's why the prison, and the prison keeper, like Potiphar, saw that. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you a little something here that, whether we're talking about institutionalism from the, from the standpoint of the business world mm -hmm. or from the standpoint of the Christian world, institutionalism takes this ability away from people. I can't tell you how many men that I saw who were brilliant engineers, chemists, and so forth, but they just weren't the right kind of people, and they didn't see what these men saw. Judah. All things in the prison being handed over to Joseph while Joseph himself was a prisoner. Yes. <laughs> um, they were all prisoners. The, the keeper of the prison gave a prisoner control of what was given to him. Yeah, that's right. I see a type of Christ in this. Amen. You got it. When Jesus came into the world, he was, he was humbled. 
-hmm. He was made low. He was made flesh yeah. as everyone else was. And yet he had control of everything and everyone, mm -hmm. even though he was himself a human and everything he did prospered. That's right. So since we, we can see God's hand working very, very clearly in Joseph in this because he himself was a prisoner in shackles controlling other prisoners that were also in shackles, but the Lord was with Lord him, and that him. made all the difference in the Lord world. Is with him. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Brother Ewan, I was also considering this, that while Potiphar and the prison keeper saw that the Lord prospered Joseph, he himself was seeing these things also. He, Joseph himself was seeing that the Lord was oh, prospering yeah. what yeah. he was doing. Confidence and Confidence yes. and a comfort. He was in prison because of a false accusation. But yeah. the Lord made evidence to him that he uh -huh. was still with him. Yeah. Yeah. He Amen. was still prospering the things yes. that he put his hand to so he could have comfort and confidence in uh -huh. the Lord. He, he's a soul, I think the soul person that this happened so much to. Potiphar made him the head of all he had. Prisoner made him the head of all, all the prisoners. And Potiphar and Pharaoh made him the head of all Egypt. So it's like, it's a threefold. Yeah. But he, he didn't become the head of Egypt till he handled his other. Right. till he was faithful, proved himself a faithful steward in a house, in a prison system. Yeah. Then it's always Amen. ready to take over a kingdom. Amen. And it didn't make him proud. No. You know, we, we know but because of the way he treated his brothers later, that he didn't hold a grudge. Yeah. He saw the Lord working as yeah. he didn't hold. Amen. And we have no record that he ever went back to Potiphar's wife. Because, you know, they would have had to come to him for grain, too. Right. <laughs> but we have no record that he that's right. he sought revenge. Amen. Yeah, it's a beautiful uh, picture, and it shows how God works with men. And you must believe this. This, this is why whatever you do in word or deed, you do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, and then whatever he gives you to do. See, this is what they prospered in what they were given to do. Yes, amen. He prospered in what he was given to do by Potiphar. He prospered in what he was given to do by the prison keeper. And he prospered in what he was given to do by Pharaoh. Yeah. So that's, that's the area where he prospered. Yeah. And it's the same with Jesus. He's the head over all things, but he prospered in the work God gave him to do. Amen. And that's how you prosper. It is we're not talking about your pocketbook. That may be involved. We don't deny that that can be involved. But you prosper in what God has given you to do. If He's given you a good mind, He's given you a quick understanding, He's given you a special sensitivity. You can pick up on things rapidly. Give that to God and be faithful with that in what God's given you to do. Says too, in every circumstance he prospered and he did his everything unto the Lord. That's right. I mean, if you if you consider yourself and you think about all these circumstances, you might be just overcome. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were a slave, you were you know in prison, all these things. But he, it doesn't say that he was overcome by these things. But he he continued and uh, continued in the Lord with these. Uh, now we've been uh, getting, and this isn't over yet. We're given to see the events that are in a person's life, Joseph, and how God orchestrated the whole thing. Now, I can tell you that if you will peruse your life as far back as you can remember and, and compare with where you, where you are now, you will find that you experience in some measure, you experience the same thing, that God working with you. Some of the experiences were Thank God you don't have to go through them again. But they were all, they all played a part in making you what you are in Christ Jesus. And it's edifying to go back and actually look at some of the disappointments and yes. things like that and see it from this perspective. Yeah. Yes, Brother Jason. Just a thought here on the, the nature of the temptation that Joseph is facing mm -hmm. here, this, this carnal <coughs> temptation. I think one of the things that this, this is teaching us it is, as we've discussed before, not all sin is the same. That's right. Now, all sin is sin. Mm -hmm. okay, we're, we're, not, we're not saying that there are some sins that are okay and some sins that... That's not at all what we're saying. Mm -hmm. I hope everybody understands that. Or everybody listening understands that. 
But there are some sins that are more serious than other sins. Now, when it comes to this kind of sin, this is a kind of sin, and this, this should be illustrated by how Joseph handles it. Mm -hmm. Like you said, Joseph is a young man in a foreign country who doesn't know nearly what any of us know today. And yet he successfully <laughs> rebuffs this, this kind of temptation. Now this should, this should teach us something. That this kind of carnality is not like, this is like footmen. This is the way this should be viewed. A young man not in Christ was able to successfully Amen. rebuff this. Yeah. Now this should tell you something about the nature of sexual sin. Mm -hmm. This is this is footman. When Jesus was tempted, yeah. there is no record that Jesus was ever tempted with a woman. Mm -hmm. When Satan tempted Jesus, he didn't parade a woman in front of him. Mm -hmm. Jesus was tempted in a much in a much different way. You read the temptation. In fact, most people read the temptations of Christ like, when was the last time you were ever tempted to turn stones into bread? I mean. You see, the, the temptations tailor it for the... That's right. Amen. The, Amen. Jesus wouldn't have any trouble rebuffing a woman's advance. I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. This should be... This is footmen. That's right. The, pe the men... Like you talk about men in ministry. The men in ministry that can't rebuff a woman's advance. Like, like what, who are these people? Yeah. Yeah. Any, any person... People not in Christ can control yes. their bodies. Amen. People not in Brother. Christ. There are people who are not Christians who are married faithfully for 50 and 60 years. Mm -hmm. This has been done. Yes. There, Satan has Satan has other temptations that are much more insidious mm -hmm. Amen. Than, than Potiphar's wife. Amen. And and you'll find too that a lot, a lot of times when you're in the Lord, now you're you should never think that you're like invincible. And impervious. But you, yeah. you don't make that mistake. But on the other hand, you'll find as you progress in the Lord, you'll find yourself up against temptations that are that are are more difficult to decipher yes. than Potiphar's Amen. wife. Amen. This this is obvious. You you can be a Christian for an hour and know this is bad. And I'm not going to do this. But but as you progress in the Lord, see, there are other things that Satan will bring at you that it will be much more challenging. Yeah, there, there are sins of the flesh. There are sins of the mind. mind. There are sins of the heart. Yes, there, are, there are things that when you're a babe in Christ or before you were in Christ, you didn't even necessarily regard as sin. Mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah, after you've been in Christ for a while, you say... It's not even right for me to think about that. That's or right. Amen. it's not even right for me to want that. Now, see, now you're on a whole different level. Amen. You're on a whole different level now. Mm -hmm. Good. Good preaching. <laughs> yes. Yes, Sister Maddie. It's a matter of Joseph leaving behind his garment. It's, it shows that. Whatever is standing between you and the way of escape yeah. has to be left behind. Amen. No matter what it is, if it's keeping you from escaping, yeah. it's not worth holding on to mm -hmm. in order so that you can walk through that door that's, that's been right. open. Amen. And there, there was a way of escape made for Joseph, and it may not have appeared to be an escape from, from what... He went to prison, but he didn't have to deal with Potiphar's wife anymore after this. That's right. Yeah. And so this was a way of escape. It led through prison like the three Hebrew children. That going, Their way of escape led through the fiery furnace. Mm -hmm. so they came out of the fiery furnace, and they were delivered from that, the trial of not bowing down before the golden statue. And so there's... A, the way of escape may not always appear to be the way of escape until you pass through it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Now there was 
There's something, I think I mentioned this, but there's something else brought out here. <clears throat> Remember, all, we've been reading this. This is how God sent Joseph yeah. into Egypt. The psalmist said he sent a man, yeah, Joseph. Right. So this is how he sent him. Because he was going to find a family, and he had to be retrievable. He had to be close at hand when the time came. So he sent him to not just a prison. This is Pharaoh's yeah, the king's right. prison. Yeah, right. The king's prisons were. He got to train him and how to manage difficult circumstances. So they, and then when the time comes, while he's in there, he's going to interpret some dreams. He's going to establish himself as someone that interprets. See, he's getting him ready for what's going to happen in Pharaoh's court. Yeah, that's right. Then when Pharaoh calls him, he's a he's ready. Yes. We live in a time where this seems like a very poignant example to us mm -hmm. of sin and temptation because because we live in a time when this is this yeah. is all over. And what what has happened in and I don't think I don't, I bet this wasn't any different in Egypt. It, most most idolatrous cultures are very sexually immoral. Yeah. Amen. So I, I don't doubt that this was we know we know from history that the Greeks and the Romans were extremely perverted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That whole culture was perverted. Mm -hmm. I don't doubt Egyptian culture was prob probably the same, probably the very same way. We live in a culture that's pagan, idolatrous, so it shouldn't surprise us. We see this kind of sin. Now what, what has happened and what people do is they cultivate an appetite for it. Yeah. And this didn't used to be the case in our own culture. Mm -hmm. A generation or two ago, this stuff, this stuff has always been going on, but it was kept secret. It was hush hush. It was people were ashamed to, yeah. to talk yeah. about it. Yeah. But but in our time, what what happens is you were making the point. Why do why do people like who claim to be Christians fall in this kind of sin? Should be obvious. Why do Christian leaders fall? Should be obvious because. There's there's a cultivation of appetite That's right. that happens be before the act is ever committed. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a cultivation of an appetite. It's yeah. just like if you cultivate an appetite for some kind of bad food that you shouldn't eat. You can do that. You can go to the doctor and the doctor says you shouldn't eat that. But you cultivate you, you cultivate an appetite and a drive for it, and that's what's happened in our culture, and that's what happens to people today. They cultivate the wrong appetites. That's right. yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Just a Amen. And really, the issue is um, this. He said, "How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against yeah. God?" Right. Well, the only people that can think like this are people who are born again. And Christ died and took sin away, so it's it's reprehensible for us to sin against God now, especially since Christ came. Now, he was able to do this before Christ came, and we've said this, but when you think about sin, you got to be able to think about it that it's against God. And when you can actually think that way, then you'll be able to um, resist the temptation. You know, I think God managed these type of things for Joseph, so yeah. he didn't encounter Potiphar's wives all over the place. Yeah. It was He managed the, he managed the circumstance so it wasn't repetitive. Yeah. But in Christ, he it, it, the, the situation can the challenge can be repetitive because we've been given resources to confront that, which brings more the more glory to God. See, but in that kind of an economy where you have resources from God that makes you adequate, in that kind of economy, to be hauled away into immorality, this this is inexcusable. Yes. <laughs> the beginning of your, your lesson here, you rehearsed a number of events and things that uh, that God He really He judged it one way or another. Mm -hmm. Some of the things, the judgments were more obvious in them than others. You mentioned that uh, in times past, God winked. He, he was being. He was being with a human race as as a parent is with a very young child. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he, was, he was having to 
to, to lead them along and show them things and be forbearing and yet not so forbearing that they didn't get the, the point. Uh, in this, even though the thread that you develop is very evident that God does direct the affairs of men according to his purpose and that his purpose will prevail regardless of, hmm. of who uh, tries to oppose it or or is uh, in line with with what he's like in the lineage or whatever. He still in each of these these situations you see the righteousness of God mm -hmm. being unfolded before us. Mm -hmm. He's showing us how he judges, the what he judges. He, he mentioned that the the patriarchs they didn't have the same understanding that we've been given, not because we're superior, but because more has been given to us. All right, but still, he judged according, you know, accordingly. Amen. He wasn't over harsh with them, yeah. and yet he was. He he did judge iniquity. Yes. He, Amen. He, he winked at it, but he didn't forget it. He yeah. didn't leave it undealt with. And he did it in such a way as to guide his, guide and direct us through history, if you will, according to his purpose. Mm -hmm. he didn't let it stray one way or the other. But as we look back on these men and say, well, I've heard people say, well, why didn't God do something with them? Why did he let that happen? Why was it, why didn't he... Why didn't he do to them what he says needs to be done to people now? It's, if you'll pay attention to what he did, you'll see he was dealing with their hearts yeah. and things, but he was doing it in a way they could understand so that we could begin to have the rudiments that our understanding is built on. Amen. If God had been immediately harsh in that day, we might not have gotten to this day. Yeah, he, he dealt with Joseph's brothers, remember? <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I did want to... They lived in torment all yeah. the time, wondering about what was going to happen to them when their father died. I wanted to say this, too, before we close, that this protection of God and way of escape and so forth is for those who are in the path of God's will. This is, this is the privilege for those who are living unto God. This is not... A path for the wayward. One other thing too is that you, you will find that for, for every legitimate desire that God has given us, He has also given us a legitimate way of satisfying or expressing that desire. Amen. And and you'll find that when you're in temptation, you have to kind of look. You have to say, you know, I, I'm being tempted here. I'm being tempted to satisfy yeah. something my own way. And mm -hmm. that, that is one of the things Jesus was tempted with. When I didn't see this for a long time. It, does, it seems strange. How is turning a stone into bread a temptation? Yeah, put it first. But it's the temptation to say, you take control. Right. You do it your way. You're in control. You have the power. See, satisfy your own desires. That's right. yeah. Do it now. Do it See, that's, that's the temptation. It's and right. you'll find that behind every temptation, that's really what's going on, no matter what the actual temptation happens to be. Mm -hmm. And so you have to say, you know what? There, God has something better for me. If, if, if I will take the, I can satisfy this desire God's way. That's right. If it's a legitimate desire. That's right. Mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah. One last thing on Joseph. It may not have looked to... An onlooker, as though Joseph was delivered. That's right, amen. Looked mm -hmm. like he was punished, but he was he had a greater deliverance. He was he whenever he fled, he fled clean. He wasn't defiled. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this record and for Joseph, for the purity of him. 
and we pray that you give us to consider all the many things that have said been said here tonight. A great uh, bag of wisdom has been dispensed by various brothers and sisters. We take it to heart, and we, Father, pledge ourselves to to live for you, to live to please you, and to live so you will put your blessing on what we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen.